Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, who is Dr. Eva Cleary, and she is a consultant cardiologist at the Oman Street Hospital. Welcome, Eva. Thank you so much, Tuti. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. Just give me one second and hopefully it should work. Can you see them OK? Yeah, we can. Perfect. OK, um, so uh, thank you so much for um, asking me to speak today. As Tudy said, my name is Eva Cleary. Um, I'm a paediatric cardiologist currently working at Great Ormond Street um, and I have subspecialty training in inherited cardiac conditions and in cardiac MRI. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about paediatric cardiomyopathies. Um, so obviously you've had this series of, of talks over the last couple of weeks and, and I know you had a full day on, on cardiomyopathy. So it's quite a short um, space of time to go through all paediatric cardiomyopathies, but I'll try and give you the highlights um, from the different sections. Um, please stop me, Tushi, if I'm running over time uh, because it is quite a bit to cover. Um, so we'll start with the definition of cardiomyopathy. So as I'm sure most of you know, cardiomyopathies are defined as abnormalities of the ventricular myocardium that are unexplained by abnormal loading conditions or congenital heart disease. Um, in terms of the difference, I suppose the first difference that we see between adult and paediatric cardiomyopathy is the breakdown of what um, the subtypes of cardiomyopathy that we see. So as you're aware, in adults, the prevalence is approximately one in 500. The numbers quoted in children are more close to three in 100,000. In adults, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy seem, tends to take the predominant um, uh, um, part of cardiomyopathy, whereas in paediatrics, dilated cardiomyopathy is the most common. However, a large cohort is also affected with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So in terms of the subtypes, similar to what you will have seen in your adult lectures, there is obviously a wide variety, including dilated um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive left ventricular non-compaction, arrhythmogenic, and then the mixed cardiomyopathies. So in terms of the etiology of paediatric cardiomyopathy, I suppose what the big thing that we need to start with and, and, and remember when we speak about paediatric cardiomyopathy is unlike adult uh, cardiomyopathy, which as a higher predominance of kind of genetic sarcomeric disease, we see a lot of other etiologies that cause cardiomyopathy in children. Um, and uh, those include inborn, inborn errors of metabolism, neuromuscular conditions, and also malformation syndromes. And so when we see a new patient with any form of cardiomyopathy, we always need to keep a kind of an open mind as to what the underlying etiology could be. In terms of differentials, apart from uh, true cardiomyopathies. There's also the, the uh, diseases that mask uh, or hide as a cardiomyopathy, and we must remember those also. So things like toxins and infections, coronary artery abnormalities, one of which is quite important in children. I've just highlighted it here with this ECG, something that if you work in adults, you probably won't see, um, but often we will get referred babies um, with a, a clinical presentation similar to that of a dilated cardiomyopathy with a poor functioning left ventricle and this ECG. Um, and what this highlights, as I, I hope you can see here, is that you've got uh, red arrows that are pointing to deep Q waves in the lateral chest leads, as well as in AVL, with a relative absence of Q waves in the inferior leads and some ST elevation in V1 to V4. And this is a very stereotypical ECG for Alcapa, which is an anomalous left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery. Um, and so any patient that we see with a new diagnosis of dilated coronary myopathy, we absolutely have to be sure that we're happy of the origin and course of the coronary arteries um, as an important differential for this clinical presentation. Another thing we sometimes see as well is tachy and bradyarrhythmias, so patients that have been in and out of SVT for a prolonged period of time, because obviously if they're small babies, we don't know that they've been in SVT. And you can see a cardiomyopathic looking echo um, without a true underlying cardiomyopathy. So the first one I'm going to talk about is dilated cardiomyopathy. So as you know, um, this is an enlargement of the left ventricle with or without thinning of the LV wall and impaired systolic function. And you can see from these echo clips, very dilated LV and left atrium and poor function with associated mitral regurgitation. So the differentials or the causes um, are multiple. Um, so I put genetic at the top, but often, to be honest, the most common one we see um, coming through our pediatric practice is infectious. So uh, myocarditis, usually viral and etiology in children, enterovirus being the most common. Other things um, with 
dilated cardiomyopathy associated with them would be those of neuromuscular disorders. Patients with um, who have had chemotherapy, in particular anthracycline, and we sometimes see some nutritional DCM with a vitamin D deficiencies and also carnitine and thymine. I've just put this slide in and I'm not going to go into it in detail, but this just shows the wide variety of underlying genetic causes that can be at play when we talk about dilated cardiomyopathy in children similar to in adults. So in terms of the clinical presentation, so this differs slightly depending on the age of the child. So it, it can be quite non-specific um, and non-descript in, in, in small babies. Um, so we get a history of poor feeding, lethargy, increased work of breathing and failure to thrive. In older children, it may be a bit more um, specific with reduced exercise capacity, shortness of breath, cough, wheeze, abdominal pain, vomiting, palpitations and syncope. So more akin to an adult presentation of heart failure. In terms of signs, um, obviously they can be quite tachycardic and tachypneic. And I suppose one of our initial things that we have to do when we see these patients is in terms of how stable they are and, and how acutely unwell they are. And these, these kind of signs can point us one way or another. So tachycardia, tachypnea, pallor and sweatiness, increased work of breathing. We often see patients with a gallop rhythm, marked patomegaly, uh, peripheral edema, and then in older children, we may see an increased JVP. In terms of investigations, I always kind of divide these into two, two kind of headings in my head. So you've got your initial investigations that are going to help you with the initial diagnosis and management of this patient. So blood gas, FBC, all of the basic investigations, including BMP and troponin. Obviously, a chest X-ray to look for cardiomegaly, pulmonary plethora, and then your ECG and echo. But then we also have to think of the underlying etiology, and this is where the quote unquote cardiomyopathy screen comes in. This is quite a broad net that we cast to look for any other weird and wonderful causes of the underlying cardiomyopathy. And this tends to incorporate metabolic conditions and um, neuromuscular problems, storage disorders. And in this also, we take DNA for storage in order to do a genetic panel if this is warranted. So I've stolen this slide from one of my colleagues in the heart failure team because I think it's really useful when we think of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy because they're quite a complex bunch of patients to um, to manage. Um, and it, basically you need to stop start at the bottom of the triangle or of the, the pyramid, I should say. And this is, as I said at the beginning, and this is ensuring hemodynamic stability. So this is your initial stabilization and management. And some of these patients come to us incredibly unwell um, and end up very rapidly uh, deteriorating in the ICU. So things like inotropes, vasopressors, intubation and advanced heart failure therapy. And as you move up this pyramid, the, tra the treatments will change. So sometimes we'll need advanced heart failure therapies um, or mechanical support if we're seeing end organ dysfunction. We want to achieve euvolemia, and sometimes we do this with, via diuretics, but also with inotropes and pressors. And then the medications that we use in order to um, adapt or to sorry to um, arrest maladaptive proceeds like ACE inhibitors, ARBs. And then this top bit, which sometimes maybe gets forgotten about in the acute setting, but is incredibly important for the long term and chronic management, is maximizing calories and um, maintaining a positive energy balance and thus um, um, MDT involvement. In terms of medical therapies for heart failure in children, it is not dissimilar to adults um, and our mainstay tends to be with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers in the first instance, with loop diuretics used as needed to achieve euvolemia, but ideally not in a long term setting. We also use mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and then rate control is often very important in these patients, which can be achieved with either DIG or Evabradine. And I say newer combination and agents, I know these have been used in adults for a longer period of time, but we have had good um, recent success in younger patients with the combined uh, agents for those with difficult to manage heart failure. The other thing that we, we come across and we have to use very frequently in these patients is mechanical support. So Greater Ormond Street is one of two paediatric centres that offers um, mechanical support for heart failure um, and also trans paediatric transplant. And so we get a lot of referrals for these patients. So the kind of three main ways we support these patients, sometimes in an acute setting, we may use ECMO. And this is often as a bridge to recovery in a severe myocarditis. We can also use it as a bridge to get them onto other mechanical support, a bridge to decision making or diagnosis, or in some acute settings, a bridge to transplant. Oh, sorry, that should say transplant on transport. <laughs> 
The other two ways we support them is through mechanical VAD support. So here on the left hand panel, you can see a Berlin heart. So this is the extracorporeal support, um, which sits outside the body and provides sometimes just LVAD support, but we can also biventricularly support these patients. And then on the right hand one, you'll see what you might be more familiar with in an adult setting, which is a hardware device, which is located inside the body with a drive line that comes out um, outside the patient. And these patients can actually go home but this can only be used in larger, uh, older patients. So the majority of our patients tend to have Berlin Heart mechanical support. So just a few specific examples that we see of a dilated cardiomyopathy in pediatric populations. So the first one is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So this is a genetic disorder that is characterized by progressive muscular degeneration and weakness. And this is due to alterations in the dystrophin gene protein. This is X-linked recessive and so it mainly affects boys and we tend to see it a lot in the pediatric population as, as it presents very early. And these boys tend to be picked up usually around the age of walking because they, they tend to have delayed motor mil milestones. They're not walking in time and this progresses over time. And the cardiac phenotype is that of dilated cardiomyopathy. And there have been large um, studies that have shown that early initiation of treatment with perindopril and ACE inhibitor is associated with lower mortality from a cardiac point of view in these patients. So the majority of our patients with Duchenne's would be started on perindopril around the age of nine or 10 in heart failure clinic. Another kind of more specific example of a dilated cardiomyopathies are those with a Laman gene mutation. So the group of patients with laminopathies. This is often associated with skeletal muscle abnormalities um, and in particular Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. The cardiac phenotype in this group of patients is that of dilated cardiomyopathy, but also of conduction disease with high degree AV block and sinoatrial nose disease. These patients are at very high risk for malignant arrhythmias and risks identified are that of non-sustained VT, low ejection fraction, a male sex, and a missense mutation. And usually they say if there's more than two of these risk factors, these patients would be higher risk for arrhythmia and you would consider ICD insertion. So I'm going to move on now to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I'm just keeping an eye on my time. <laughs> um, and this is increased left ventricular wall thickness in the absence of loading conditions um, in, for example, high blood pressure, valvular disease or congenital heart disease. And you can see here in both of these images, you've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in these images, you can see you've got an asymmetric morphology where the septum is much more hypertrophic than the lateral and um, inferior walls. So in pediatric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as I said at the beginning, this the etiology of this is widespread. We can have inborn errors of metabolism, malformation syndromes, neuromuscular disorders, and also sarcomeric and other cardiac genetic abnormalities. Um, just to go into the etiology in a bit more detail, in the sarcomeric patients, we tend to see the majority of patients with MYH7 and MYBPC3 mutations. We have a large cohort of patients um, that we group together as the RASopathies, and these are patients that have gene mutations in the RAS um, gene pathway, including Noonan syndrome, Leopard syndrome, and cardiocutaneo facial syndrome. Metabolic storage disorders like Pompe's disease, neurodegenerative disorders like Friedrich's ataxia, and multiple different mitochondrial disorders, all which have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as part of their phenotype. In terms of the clinical presentation, um, the non-infantile HCM, so usually the non-syndromic HCM, so the more um, sarcomeric, have a varied um, group of symptoms similar to that of adults. And that tends to um, depend on the underlying um, phenotype and processes. So the symptoms may be due to outflow tract obstruction, ischemia or microvascular disease. They may have symptoms of diastolic dysfunction or restrictive physiology arrhythmias or later in the presentation in the so-called burnout phase, they may develop heart failure symptoms. In terms of management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in children as similar to adults, the goals of therapy are twofold um, and they, they are symptom control and prevention of sudden death. And this was something that I thought was quite important when I first started and inherited that we don't treat the echo and we don't treat the ECG, we treat the symptoms. And so if you have a patient that's completely asymptomatic, um, with some LV outflow tract obstruction, we wouldn't necessarily start medical therapy. And so medical therapy are in order to improve symptoms. And the, the mainstays of therapy that we use are beta blockers, disapyramide in those with outflow tract obstruction and calcium channel blockers. 
very rarely we have to do um, surgical interventions in the form of a myectomy, but this is usually in a very carefully chosen group of patients um, and definitely not as part of our first line in, um, therapies. The next big part of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy management is prevention of sudden death. So as you will be aware, in adult patients, there has been uh, long-standing uh, risk calculators that have been used in order to predict risk of sudden death in these patients. Prior to recently, there hasn't been the equivalent for children. However, there's been a recent um, uh, project with uh, colleagues of mine and a paediatric um, risk score calculator has been developed. And I've just put up this paper um, that was published that shows that um, previously, I think it was thought that paediatric uh, sarcomeric HCM was um, maybe not as risky or high risk as adult um, patients with HCM. Um, however, these papers have shown that these children with um, sarcomeric HCM have higher risks of sudden cardiac death than their adult um, patients and also increased risk of heart failure, heart transplant and VAD. And so one of my colleagues, Dr. Narish, along with Dr. Kasky, developed this International Pediatric Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Consortium, where they um, got information from patients all over the world and developed a pediatric risk calculator in order to try and predict risk of sudden cardiac death and help guide ICD implantation. I won't go through it in detail, but you can see that you can access this via this website. And you can put in these um, parameters, which include hot weight, gender, age, um, uh, left atrial diameter, outflow track gradient, wall thickness and unexplained syncope and non-sustained ventricular tachycardia to help and risk stratify these patients in terms of malignant ventricular arrhythmias. So that brings us on to the possibility of ICD and we have a large cohort of paediatric patients now with ICDs. We have three main options including transvenous, epicardial and subcutaneous. We tend to try and go with subcutaneous um, ICD if possible, but this is um, limited by weight and size. Um, and so some of our patients end up with transvenous systems. Epicardial tends to be reserved for the very young and small patients. Just to highlight some specific paediatric conditions that we see with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotype. The first one is Pompe's disease. So this is a glycogen storage disorder and it's due to variants in the GAA gene. And so what happens is you get a um, buildup of glycogen and this builds up in skeletal muscles, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. And patients with infantile Pompe's present very early and they present with failure to thrive, hypotonia, myopathy, hepatomegaly and respiratory failure. From a cardiac point of view, they tend to get severe biventricular hypertrophy and untreated, they die with, from heart failure in the first year of life. Commencement of enzyme replacement therapy early is associated with much improved cardiac outcomes. And these are just some little tips to remember in, in terms of kind of triggering the thought of Pompe's disease if you see a patient like this. So this ECG, as you can see, shows very dramatic biventricular hypertrophy and widespread repolarization abnormalities. This family tree shows consanguinity, which obviously would increase your suspicion for a metabolic disorder in a patient. And here you can see this extreme biventricular hypertrophy that we see in Pompe's disease and storage disorders with severe hypertrophy of both the left and right ventricle. And the red flags for these patients is parental consanguinity, a short PR interval, extreme biventricular hypertrophy and hepatosplenomegaly. The other um, syndrome I was going to um, flag in paediatric is Noonan syndrome. So this is a genetic disorder due to a mutation in the RAS pathway. And this results in a spectrum of symptoms and physical features that vary greatly in range and severity. Um, and the rasopathies or the RAS pathway includes many genes, but the most um, common one that we see is PTPN11, which accounts for approximately 50% of these patients. They have multi-system involvement and in, their, in terms of their physical features, they have quite a, um, a um, patho pathognomonic um, phenotype with short stature, wide set eyes, low set ears. They tend to get kyphosis and scoliosis and wide set nipples. From a cardiac point of view, they get ASDs, VSDs and um, PDA. They Commonly we see supervalvar pulmonary stenosis, but often they can get polyvalvulopathies and also hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. So these patients fall under both congenital heart disease and uh, inherited cardiac disorders with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. From a non-cardiac point of view, they get learning difficulties, lymphatic issues and deranged clotting. 
So you can see here um, the ECG that we tend to see, which shows a superior axis. You get supervalvary um, pulmonary stenosis, which we can see here, and then biventricular hypertrophy. So I'm just going to quickly go through the remaining cardiomyopathies that we see in pediatrics. So restrictive cardiomyopathy, as you know, is a myocardial disorder that usually results from increased myocardial stiffness, and this leads to impaired filling. Usually um, the, there's normal biventricular size and systolic function until later in the disease. And you can see here in this patient, this um, classic echo findings with relatively normal or small ventricles, but extremely dilated atria. It's quite rare in the paediatric population and accounts for about 2.5 to 3% of all paediatric cardiomyopathies. From a genetic po point of view, sarcomeric um, gene mutations are the most commonly implicated genes in restrictive cardiomyopathy. However, we also see some non-sarcomeric genes um, associated with this condition. The clinical presentation is quite a wide range. Uh, symptoms result from increased ventricular filling pressures, and this leads to pulmonary edema, pulmonary hypertension, hepatomegaly, and peripheral edema. And these patients tend to present with symptoms of shortness of breath, lethargy, peripheral edema, and sometimes syncope. The cardiac findings um, is often in a mixed phenotype with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They tend to get quite enlarged atria and so are at risk of thromboembolic, um, thromboembolic events. This is often associated with conduction disease and also these patients are a high risk group for malignant arrhythmias. The main differential would be that of constrictive pericarditis and the difference in pediatric is pediatric practice with these patients is we don't tend to see amyloidosis and sarcoidosis so they don't come into our differential in the same way they would in adults. From an outcome point of view, restrictive cardiomyopathy has a pretty grim outcome um, in paediatrics, and it tends to be worse if it's pure restrictive um, as opposed to restrictive cardiomyopathy in the context of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Medical management is quite limited for these patients, and no clear therapies exist to treat the diastolic dysfunction. We also use diuretics if they have marked pulmonary congestion and anticoagulation if there's severe dilatation of the atria but we usually consider these patients earlier for cardiac transplant than we would with other cardiomyopathies, given the limited medical options and also the high risk of arrhythmias. We do a right heart cath in all of these patients in order to establish PVR and to decide if pulmonary vasodilators would be helpful or necessary, and also to see if these patients are in fact transplant candidates. Arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is a condition then characterized by fiber fatty replacement of the myocardium myocardium predisposing to arrhythmias. Um, and you can see here from these still images from some MRI data where you can see late gadolinium enhancement representing this fibrosis and fiber fatty replacement of the myocardium in patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. The replacement of normal myocardium with fibrosis and fat has two main kind of clinical effects. Firstly, it interrupts normal electrical pathways, and this is what leads to arrhythmia, but it also can reduce cardiac function, leading to heart failure. Historically, this disease was known um, as ARVC and specifically affecting the right ventricle. However, we now know that this uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy can affect both ventricles, um, and also there is a significant overlap with dilated cardiomyopathy. Previously, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy wasn't really um, thought to be an entity in paediatric practice. However, we now know that given its overlap with dilated cardiomyopathy, we do in fact see this and we have a, a full arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy clinic at Great Ormond Street where we see large volumes of these patients, both for family screening, but also for affected patients. In terms of their clinical presentation, often they're asymptomatic, they may have palpitations or syncope, and later in the disease, they get heart failure type symptoms. In terms of signs on ECG, we see low voltage QRS complexes, T-wave inversion in the precordial leads, epsilon waves, and on signal average ECG, we have evidence of late potentials. We regularly do ambulatory monitoring on these patients and see ventricular ectopy and sometimes ventricular tachycardia. Often in these patients, the echocardiograms are normal with perhaps mild LV dilatation. And the cardiac MRI is very useful in that it can show subtle areas of akinesia and dyskinesia, but importantly also shows fibrosis in the form of late gadolinium enhancement. Here we have the Padua criteria, which are for biventricular arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which I won't go through in detail, but are technically adult data, but it's what we also use in our pediatric um, population currently. The mainstay of management in, is in regard to risk stratification and prevention of sudden death. And this can depend on what the underlying mutation is as to what, how we risk stratify them, family history of sudden death, 
the arrhythmia burn in on ambulatory monitoring and also LGE on CMR. And then finally, left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy. This is the disease of endomyocardial trabeculations that increase in number and prominence and represent a developmental disorder of the myocardium. And here in these images, you can see echo images of uh, a non-compaction in one of our patients where you see this very trabeculated left ventricle. And most clearly on short axis, you can see this ratio of the trabeculated segments to the normal myocardium. LV non-compaction can be slightly controversial as there's a debate as to whether it is a distinct cardiomyopathy or is actually a description of a morphological feature of other cardiomyopathies. Clinically, it can range from benign prominent LV trabeculations to a more severe course. Sometimes they can have systolic or diastolic dysfunction, life-threatening arrhythmias or thromboembolic events, although this is less common in our pediatric population. From a diagnostic point of view, cardiac MRI is very helpful. Um, and the current diagnostic criteria are a ratio of the non-compacted myocardium to compacted myocardium of greater than 2.3, and also a trabeculated left ventricular mass of over 20% of the total mass. Oh. oh, sorry, my slides seem to have frozen, sorry. So <laughs> in summary, um, there are a broad range of pediatric cardiomyopathies with many overlapping phenotypes. The underlying etiology is really, really important and must be investigated th thoroughly. Multi-system involvement is common, especially in the non-sarcomeric -sar forms of cardiomyopathy, and so MDT input is incredibly important. We must always remember conditions that mimic um, cardiomyopathies, in particular DCM and Alcapa, and always remember parental and family screening. So I'm sorry, because I know that was an incredibly quick uh, whistle stop tour through paediatric cardiomyopathy. Um, but thank you so much for the um, time to talk to you today. And I'm happy to answer any questions now or later. Thank you so much, Eva. That was a great overview of all the cardiomyopathy conditions. Um, we haven't got time for questions now, but we, we will have the MDT later. So I'm sure people will be able to ask you then. So I'm going to hand over to Paz um, to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Paz.